a gleaming metropolis drifts among the clouds, unbeknownst to the world below, the flying city of Ayla. Fleeing the destruction of their homeland, the long-forgotten bird folk constructed a clockwork sanctuary with the aid of a group of ancient automatons. Cut off from the surface for centuries, the brilliant minds of Ayla have ushered in an age of industry across their mechanized society, melding machine and magic to create formidable airships, clockwork companions, and even a lineage of sentient bio-constructs with upgradable bodies. But as the denizens of Ayla revel in the dazzling genius of their mages and tinkerers, a storm is brewing on the horizon. Ancient threats stir within the forgotten catacombs beneath the city. As raiders descend on the metropolis from beyond its walls, Ayla will soon need its heroes as the winds bring grim tidings. What fate will you forge? Hi, I'm Garnbreak1, and this is Midgardia's Cool Crowdfunding Show. I'm here today with Sean White. How's it going? Good, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. So I hear tell us about Overclock, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Overclock is a campaign guide uh, that's centered around um, a steampunk flying city and all of the technology and clockwork mechanics and whatnot that you can find there. Um, it's the first Kickstarter that uh, me and my partner have worked on uh, as part of our business, Mage Armoire, and um, it mostly focuses around the ability to customize and upgrade because that's that's what we've seen a lot of people like in DD. I mean that's the most that's the most fun part. It's why everyone makes a million characters even if they're a forever DM. Definitely no personal experience there. But um it's it's all about different ways to customize yourself. Like we have um there's a whole like chart and system for how to upgrade your weapons with all sorts of like gears and mechanics and you know you can get like a heated blade on a sword or uh all, all sorts of stuff. One of the things we're most excited for is we have our own sort of robotic player heritage called the Steam Weld, um, which we know robots have been done before in D&D, but what's unique about ours is as you level up, instead of taking an ability score improvement or a feat, you can instead just physically upgrade your body. You can get an arm cannon for a sort of a spellcaster build or, you know, like spring-loaded hidden weapons, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and um, likewise, alongside that, there are uh, construct familiars, which can also have, a, which also have a, a system to upgrade them uh, as you level up. So instead of becoming obsolete, like you know the mastiff you had at first level, you have something that actually works and helps, um, and they're pretty cute. So that helps too. Yeah, I saw the the clocktopus in the trailer. I love the clocktopus. <laughs> Yeah, it's everybody's favorite. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I I mentioned it to some other people that I play with, and everybody just latched right onto the clocktopus. <laughs> well, that is the goal with the sort of <laughs> proverbial mascot constructs, so... Yeah, uh, also the... Was it the, the Hearth Breath Hound? Also very good. The Hearth Forged Hound. Hearth Forged Hound, yes. The, the fire-breathing St. Bernard. Yeah. yeah, very strong. Big fan. <laughs> So, yeah, so those guys are are meant to be those guys are meant to be like um, Saint Bernards that would like go rescue people in the mountains and stuff, and they would like bring like a a barrel whiskey, of brandy around yeah. the neck. Yeah, so it like it, it's able to heat its body so it can like help stranded people, and then it also it produces a very strong alcoholic version of a health potion. <laughs> That's incredible, and also since it's alcoholic, it won't freeze. Exactly. That's definitely a thing I thought of. <laughs> That's the spirit. I, I can yep. tell that you're a, a very experienced DM by that response. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, um, no, number of times they've been like, oh my god, this conspiracy, and I've been like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. just delete a whole page of notes. <laughs> Book that um, I think a lot of people will be very excited about, um, because... <clears throat> It's sort of it's sort of always been a, a classic fantasy thing to have these flying boats with balloons, airships. And we've sort of taken the vehicle combat system of D&D, which can be very clunky. Um, I'm sure they've made some improvements in Spelljammer, but it's still... It's, it's still iffy. Um, I mean, I, I remember playing Ghosts of Saltmarsh, and we were having a ship battle, and it was so 
boring because we couldn't use any of our character stuff because the cannons were better. So we're just like, I guess I'll shoot the cannon again. So we've sort of um, revamped that and, and made our own sort of combat system that uh, is a lot more character focused. Um, essentially, you get to take ship related actions and your own actions. So you still get to like have the spotlight of like, I'm going to go jump on the other ship or I'm going to cast a fireball, you know, on their engine or something. Um, but uh, you still get to also use the cool ship. Uh, and the ships are also going to be, of course, very customizable and upgradable. There's going to be all sorts of kind of interchangeable weapons and shielding and stuff. Um, and we, we have a couple uh, sample ones that are already um, going to be in the book. Uh, we have some like very normal ones, like some ones that are small and don't have a lot of armor, but they're really fast. Um, we have other ones that instead of using like the sort of blimp dirigible thing, uh, they have like elemental air engines, which are like they harness air energy and they they kind of look like um like radio tubes uh which i think just you know more cool aesthetic stuff anyways um yeah so airship combat is going to be a big part of it uh, i mean like i said with the sort of sky pirates from zatar and stuff like there's a lot of there is a lot of airborne conflict and um i think people tend to want to do that even if the game's not really built for it so absolutely and uh, as somebody who spent far too many hours playing Guns of Icarus online back when there were more than three people on online at any given time, uh, I'm a big fan of airship combat. I never, I never would have guessed somebody would act. That's my inspiration for the airships. I never would have guessed anyone would have ever brought that up. <laughs> oh man, yeah, no, we used to play like I don't know, twelve hours a week or something of Gun Guns of Icarus online. Like, damn, we were that pretty. Was so... We were pretty good. It's such a cool game. <laughs> yeah, we uh, I have many fond memories on like the the Pyramidium, uh, just like yeah. cruising through like horrible destroyed Paris. You know, it's good times. That game is so fucking cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, they do take a lot of inspiration from that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, thinking about my times on the machine gun. It's all coming back to me. Um, so good. Yeah. God. So what can you tell me about the other inhabitants of Ayla? So we have a lot of bird folk. Um, and of course, there's been other Kickstarters like Humblewood and, and others that have their own versions of bird folk. But so we so we decided to um, pick some birds that really haven't been done before. My uh, my favorite and the one that's on the cover of the book is the Humfolk, which is, of course, based off a hummingbird. They're extremely fast, but because of their extremely high metabolism, if you if you fly for too long, you start getting exhausted. Um, likewise, you know, they have crazy dexterity and um, are just overall very cute. They're like three feet tall. Um, we also have uh, vulturekin, um, which are a bit creepier. Um, they definitely, it's, it's sort of this interesting um, balance of like, they they tend to have sort of an odd culture um, with a lot of like honor and reverence around death and death makes everyone uncomfortable. <laughs> so they're sort of painted in this bad light, even though the vast majority of them are like kind of like pious and respectful because they have this ancestry related to death, um, which is not stats at all, but I think it's cool. Uh, they also have um, a lot of the bird folk we have have sort of limited flight where they have uh, feathered arms so so you can't like carry anything while you're flying which hopefully will sort of mitigate the opness of uh flying we also got fowl folk which are like any type of poultry bird i guess like chickens ducks uh quails um and we have a couple um we have pelican folk which their whole thing is just <laughs> you can carry a lot of stuff in your giant beak um i think there's heron folk in there as well heron folk yeah yeah that's that's another one that's good uh they're very tall and lanky giving them some extra reach uh they're also like very graceful like once a day you can choose to succeed a dexterity saving throw or or redo it i think um right on right on i there's a lot of fun birds i i adore the vulturekin uh the the design that's shown in the trailer is fantastic they look yeah spooky. I, I, I based him off of a, a vulture at a nearby nature center. Um, so 
is uh they're like they're called the black vulture and if you look at one like not in pictures but like if you look at one in person it's just sort of this like vanta black bob blob with where their body is and then like a little gray head sticking out of it very good i uh i like birds <laughs> me too <laughs> i uh i met a raven at a zoo once who had been trained by somebody to say blackjack over and over so they treated that as his name, like he was just left in a park or something for whatever reason, and they they rescued him. Uh, it's in Cleveland. Um, yeah, you just you you say hi to him, and he just goes blackjack. <laughs> it's very cute. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, birds are good. What else is going on, Nayla? Um, quite a bit. I haven't even covered like half of it. Um, <laughs> so we also have a subclass for every class that is very much fitting the steampunk theme. Um, we have uh, the Rust Druid, uh, and there's this sort of like sect of Rust Druids in the city that are sort of anti-civilization and, you know, because the whole city is made out of metal and they're trying to corrode it and destroy it uh, and whatnot <laughs> is, you know, anarchy. Um, but uh, there's, <laughs> there, so the Rust Druid is one you can play as. Um, there's also our ranger subclass is called the Storm Chaser. And basically, because the city is flying, it has a very limited supply of water. So what these people go out and do is they get these, like, nets of, like, super thin wires, and they fly through clouds with them to, like, wick all of the moisture. And then they bring that back to the city as water. Um, so I sort of had that idea first, and then I was like, okay, but the ones who would tackle, like, really big, scary, like, thunderheads and stuff would have to be like pretty skilled. So the, the Storm Chaser um, subclass are uh, very electrical themed. They also have a handful of like specific magic items that like reduce lightning damage and stuff. Uh, they're very storm themed. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Oh, the fighter subclass is, um, I always like the idea of classes or subclasses that are based around like a special object. Um, so the fighter subclass has an exosuit basically, like a bunch of like hydraulics and pistons and, and stuff to help them be stronger. So right off the bat, they do a little bit more damage. And then uh, over time, you get more features related to the sort of mechanics of the exosuit. Uh, like my favorite is um, precision, precision strikes, where basic, you, basically you've like programmed arm movements or whatever into the exosuit somehow. So you, whenever you make an attack roll, you can just choose to roll 10. Uh, and plus bonuses. Uh, you can only do it a couple times a day. It's not like permanent because that would be broken. But, but I think it's neat. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like uh, it's almost like hitting a macro button or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else? We have uh, ooh the barbarian. Um, this is <laughs> this. It's it's definitely a paradigm shift because it's like the only sort of smart nerdy barbarian that I can think of. Um, and it's it's uh, called the Path of Alchemic Vigor, and basically whenever you go into a rage, rather than it just being, like, anger making you immune to damage somehow, you inject, like, this uh, mutagenic toxin thing into your arm, or drink something, or, or whatnot. I know needles make some people uncomfortable. Um, but uh, when you do that, you rage, and you're actually, like, chemically altered by this thing, and it, it does all sorts of stuff. You can pick from, like, three different, um, or four different... Um, like effects it could have like you could do fervor which prevents your rage from ending earlier you could do uh, vitriol which um, makes uh, creatures who hit you take some acid damage and and those improve over time um, but my favorite my favorite part about it is it's uh, sort of like a Jekyll and Hyde thing like instead of being a dude who's always burly you can just be like a skinny little weirdo and then you inject something and you're like a giant hulking monster uh, and I, I always love characters like that <laughs> it's pretty good and, uh, yeah, you don't, you don't see that in a lot of things because of the, like, drug connotations and stuff, but, yeah. It's... Yeah, well, I was thinking mostly of Bioshock when I designed it with, like, the needles and stuff, but, um, I think, you know, the, the option to have it be a potion or really anything else, it's just anything you take. Um, Nicotine patch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I like that, actually. <laughs> you mentioned Bioshock. I, there's some substantial, you know, Bioshock influence here. Uh, is is that why it has all the sweet art deco theming? Actually, weirdly, I've never actually played Bioshock. I just know of it. But um, actually, a lot of our aesthetics were inspired by uh, in the show Legend of Korra. 
uh, Republic City has this like very specific vibe to it where it's like magic and technology existing right beside each other. Um, and it is sort of this like industrial era. And I just found that really cool, especially with the ways they incorporated bending and stuff into how the city actually runs. Um, so it's taking some inspiration in, ter in terms of like energy and vibe from that. But I also am a history nerd and I love like all the like roaring 20s and, and uh, industrial revolution stuff. And I, I like the idea of like steampunk, but not just Victorian, sort of like m mushing that together with um, more like modernist art deco uh, theming and stuff. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, Art Deco is a fantastic architectural style, and the flourishes are very distinctive and, you know, visually nice. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't, don't think I realized how much I liked it until, until I started, like, <laughs> doing it for the book, and I was like, oh, this is cool! <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, look around and find out. <laughs> uh, so, who is, who is Overclock targeted towards? Overclock is targeted towards um, players that player. Oh, okay, it's targeted towards players and GMs. It's GMs that want to um, have a handful of uh, one shot ventures that can either be one shots or strung together uh, as just a full like level one to five mini campaign, um, and also give them a lot of options for like monsters and encounters and, and whatnot. And it's also for players who want the ability to upgrade their stuff and play as a in my opinion, more interesting robot heritage. Um, that might be controversial, but I think ours is cool. Um, and for, for players who want to play as, as uh, weird bird folk, um, also another perk for DMs is because this flying city is so... One of, its, one, one of the like, main things about it is it is like secret from the world below because it doesn't want, it doesn't want the nations below getting all the tech and using it to kill each other. Like, they... they lifted up into the sky during a war-torn era, and they don't want anyone to get what they have uh, since they've advanced up there. Um, and the result of that means, since the city is secret and in the sky, it can be basically plopped into any campaign setting that already exists. So if you need to, if you can't think of an adventure to do, you can just be like, well, you guys end up here, and, and there's this specific uh, one-shot idea. You're gonna, like, there's there's a mirror factory full, full, uh, infested with mercury monsters or whatever. Um, a bunch of airships have gone missing and you go out and find it. They're all like webbed together with chains and there's like these uh, uh, spider constructs crawling all over it. Um, that's my favorite one of the adventure ideas so far. Um, Pretty gnarly. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, thought it'd be really neat. Yeah. So you've got, you know, a, a lovely bunch of one shot adventures that can work as. Uh... It, it, it ways to introduce people to, you know, this sweet flying city full of, like, birds and constructs, and there's one thing in the trailer I'm remembering now that we haven't uh, gotten to, and there's something about ancient, ancient constructs in there that helped build the city. Bird folk constructed a clockwork sanctuary with the aid of a group of ancient automatons. Can you, can you tell me a bit about that? Oh, yeah, we're getting, we're getting in the big lore part. All right, um, so the city... The city basically it was formed 500 years ago as of the book's sort of spot in time. And um, did I say 400? I meant five. It was formed, it was formed 500 years ago in the sort of uh, narrative time of the book itself. Um, and while it was being created, uh, the bird folk who were attempting to flee um, the destruction of their homeland um, were sort of beset by... Uh, a human army to the to from one side and an elf army to the other side and um they had found this ancient stone underground that seemed kind of inert and it was like surrounded by all these weird turned off robots um and the stone which was later called the vow stone um it has some sort of alien intelligence nobody really knows what it's about but it it is this super powerful like being that just decided like all right i'm going to help here so as their as their tech was sort of failing the vowstone released a bunch of magic all the robots woke up and held back the armies as they rose up into the sky and basically now the vowst well for one nobody knows how the city flies there's a ton of theories but in the last 500 years since the the city rose up nobody's really sure what is keeping it up there um 
which is such a fun narrative thing to run with. Cause I mean, the only adventure in there, like it doesn't need to be canonical. You can make it whatever you want. You could make it a demon pact. You can make it a, a dead God. Like you can do whatever the fuck you want with that. Um, it's super, super open-ended. Um, and then the other thing that happened is the Vow Stone is sort of responsible for um, keeping the city secret in and of itself. Um, and it, it controls those very same ancient robots, uh, which are called the Partition. Um, and they basically serve to like, they're kind of like the Men in Black, uh, where if somebody like sees Ayla or encounters Ayla and Tech on the surface, they will, they will like <laughs> be able to pinpoint their location and find them and either take them to the city <laughs> or wipe their memory um so like there's definitely even though it's a very it's a very uh sort of on the surface very happy cheerful prosperous place there's there's some dark stuff going on in there um and it's kind of ambiguous as to like why the Valstone is doing this is is it evil or is it just looking out for the best interests of the city is it you know does it is it does it have good interests but it's doing bad things to get those it's it's very uh I, I love moral gray area. <laughs> if if you uh, end up with some alien trading cards that weren't supposed to be released yet, these guys are going to hunt you down and kidnap you. Yeah, if our stuff gets leaked, <laughs> a 15-foot tall <laughs> robot will crash through your ceiling. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Sorry, I like I like horrible giant robot men in black because, like, Surely, them being fifteen foot feet tall causes some complications with the hiding things thing. Like, you go down to memory wipe one dude, and they have to memory wipe like six others because they saw you. It's yeah, just sort of a problem. Yeah, fair enough. We also, I so this this started as a campaign setting. I was just running for friends at school, um, and during that campaign, I had one one of the villains because the the partition protects the city. One of the villains just shipped a bunch of alien tech to the surface so that they, all of the all of the robots would be like preoccupied with that so then they could execute like their plot in the city. Nice. Um, but I mean these these guys are terrifying. They're all challenge fifteen and there's fifteen of them within the city. Um, and like they're they're basically like government black ops, like like any anything that just needs to be done and and quickly and quietly, they go do it. Um, and the interesting part is the Vowstone controls the partition, but it's not the government of the city. There's there's a democratic like council of eight people from the eight dis districts of the city, and they like they control like anything else, but anything related to Ayla's secrecy, the Vowstone is like all over that. Uh, so a lot of inherent conflict. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So even if they wanted to reveal themselves to the rest of the, to the rest of the world, the Valstone and the Partition would not allow that. Right, and the majority of Alien citizens agree with the decision to stay hidden. But I mean, that's been taught to them for five hundred years, so of course they would agree with the things they were to told as children. <laughs> um, and some people, you know, some people are trying to destroy Ayla. Some people don't like it. There's the Rust Druids, of course, which are trying to like corrode Ayla enough to make it fall, uh, which is going to be rough because they don't know what's holding it up. But um, and then yeah. there's there's also there's two other um, flying cities that are sort of rivals with Ayla. There's um, one called Zatar, uh, which is this sort of very draconic themed city of a lot of lizard folk and kobolds and dragonborn. Um, and they're all ruled by a very cruel ancient black dragon. And the whole city is levitating on top of a massive ancient dragon turtle shell. Um, and it's like, got like a very spiky, uh, appearance. And, um, there's always conflict between them and Ayla because Ayla has a lot more resources than they do. And they're ruled by one very greedy monster. So, um, there's a lot of like piracy going on there. Um, and then the other flying city, um, this one, Ayla doesn't even know it exists for sure. It's just sort of this rumor. Like there's this one area of sky a few miles away from where Ayla usually floats that's just completely full of a black storm. And the storm cloud never moves and the lightning in it's red and anyone who goes near it die, like doesn't come back. Um, but within this storm, um, there is a city uh, that is entirely made up of vampires. Um, because 
they realized when they found this storm that was just seemingly there, it's seemingly there, this like weird weather anomaly. Um, they were like, well, we don't have to deal with sun if we go up inside that storm that doesn't end. Um, but over time, the like bizarre magic of this weird storm has started to like mutate them and give them like more lightning powers. And uh, they're called, um, Aelin's called them the clicks and they're sort of like a uh, boogeyman. Um, like nobody, most people don't really believe in them and it's kind of like you're a UFO conspiracist if you do. Um, but they, the reason they're called that is because uh, they use the like, clicks to communicate in battle and stuff on ships, like a, like a clicking language. Uh, because that's like one of the few sounds that can like carry over wind and s storms and stuff. So um, there's a lot going on there that I'm working to flesh out. Um, the first version of them were very just sort of like high fantasy thing, and I was like, I I feel like I should make this more in line with the steampunk stuff. So now they have all sorts of like weird body modifications, like gear jaws and and um, giant giant like blood sucking syringes for teeth and like. Um, <laughs> They're awful. I love them. Um. <laughs> I I love the the lightning vampires with syringes for teeth. That's the good stuff. Yeah, man. It's I mean that is sort of my brand. I I've been drawing robots for this now for for a while, but my usual my usual subject matter is just like just the worst monsters. <laughs> just awful. You can check us out on Instagram uh, at Mage Armoire. Um, we have a lot of bad monsters, all with stats, so. <laughs> right. On, Sorry right for the plug. No, no, for sure. I mean, you're here to plug stuff. Fair enough. You seem to have a thing about needles. Uh, it, it's, it's come up a lot in this interview, in terms of, like, monster designs and stuff. That's all I got. Is that, like, intentional? I didn't realize it until you said that oh god <laughs> what's wrong with me um no i i think they make people really uncomfortable and that helps with sort of body horror related monsters i mean there's also the subclass where you can use a needle but um that that was mostly just inspired by the bioshock visual um but the the horrifying vampires with them that's just feels it feels like a good way to mechanize blood sucking like Instead of just using teeth, you could use this awful <laughs> machine on your face. Um, and I just think that's that's a pretty neat idea. Um, yeah, shoot. There's a lot of needles. What the hell? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, astute viewers may have noticed I've, I've been drinking unnamed sports drink this entire interview instead of my usual just horrible caffeine. And that's because I've got to go donate blood later, which ties wonderfully into the needle thing. If you're medically able, please donate blood. There is a constant shortage all the time. Um, and yeah, that's it for my... Please donate blood. That's yeah, you don't need us. all the blood in there. Yeah, I'd like, if you if you have a thing about needles, you can just, like, go and see how it all works. It's fine. Or donate money. And, and if, if you pass out, you won't be there for it, so... It's true. Yes. Donate blood. That's my message. Yeah. And also back overclock. Everyone's... <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Everyone's got too much blood in them. Donate some of it. Exactly. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>